Good morning. Please turn with me to Job chapter 29 as we look at the subject this morning or subject this morning because, because, and why because? Well, because there is a hinge. Sometimes we talk about doorway verses, just like those two doors hang on two hinges that connect them, allow them to be a little bit more functional if they were just a flat wall. There are some hinges in these chapters that allow them to serve multiple purposes and become useful. And so in the very beginning of this chapter, Job chapter 29, what Job is doing, he's talking about what life was like in his prime. So we talked about a little bit on Wednesday night. He talks about what it was like when things were good and life was going easy. And we had a little bit of discussion about whether or not those references to his steps being washed in butter and oil simply flowing forth from the rock had to do with just the way that uh, he held, sorry, the way that he lived his life being a successful businessman with crops and whatnot, or whether or not it was a, a multiple kind of reference to the fact that he did do business in those trades and that those trades went really smoothly for him in his prime. But Job does not simply talk about what life was like in his prime. As we mentioned, he is going to give us a purpose statement, letting us know what he focused on in his time of blessing when God made everything seem like it flowed so smoothly. And thus, the term in chapter 29 we want to focus on in verse 12. Because I delivered the poor who cried for help and the fatherless who had none to help him, the blessings of him who was about to perish came upon me and I caused the widow's heart to sing for joy. The rest of that chapter, as we mentioned, on Wednesday night has to do with, like we said, his purpose statement. But understand, Job had blessings that came directly from God. But it's like we say with investments. It's one thing to invest all your stocks in Bitcoin. Good luck with that if you did that. But <laughs> not to make fun because we all have the tendency to get, like they say, you don't want to invest on emotion because we can all get emotionally invested in some things that just don't wash out, like our brother was saying. Um, you want to have, as Brother Ed Wharton used to say, it beyond your heart, you need it in your head. And so if we are looking at investing, Job's blessings are coming from above. But like we said, when Jesus was asked what the greatest commandment was, he said, love God. And I'll throw in a bonus for you, love people. John, the beloved disciple, in his letter, his epistle, 1 John, said, none of you have seen God at any time. None of us have. So when we're claiming how much we love God, how do we really know? Well, it has to do with the way we treat people. Right. And so that's what we're seeing in the life of Job. And so when Job is being blessed, we're seeing that it manifests itself in the way that he creates a healthy environment. We said it on Wednesday night. How many of y'all want the best house in the hood? Okay, we didn't have the best house in the hood, but my grandfather took care of us. OK. And none of us were really doing all that well unless we learned how to make sure that our neighbors as much as possible we're doing well, too. We said you can build the walls as high as you want. You can electrify the fences. At some point, you got to go outside. And how your life looks out outside of your walls has everything to do with how your neighbors are doing around you. And Job seemed to have that well in mind. And he said, look, if I got enough to share, my kids are doing pretty well. How, how well, Job? He was offering up sacrifices for his own kids. But one of the things that we do in terms of, in America, like they say, in real estate, I've said it before, location, location, location. Why are we, picking, why are we so picky about location? <laughs> because you'd have a great house, but the value of it's not so great if the environment's not good. Wouldn't it be nice to live in a place where you didn't have to worry about location? You could just go pick your house, right? And so all the different things that we worry about in terms of location, location, that's half the battle. It's gone. Why? Because we're looking out for one another in a way that makes, makes it irrelevant as to where we're living. Because everybody has the potential to make the most of what they're doing. Is that Marcus going off on one of his rants again? Of course it is. But <laughs> this is one that's born out in the life of Job. A wise man, as we have seen. Uh, sorry. I left off with a story <laughs> at the end of class where I talked about we had what they call a ringer. And I didn't get to finish what that story was like. When I was in grad school, we had one of our friends who was, he played for the U of M's football team. And uh, he didn't just play for the U of M's football team, he was a star. And he ended up getting, getting drafted by the Green Bay Packers. And while he was on break one time, he showed up to one of our flag football games, intramural football. He's like, you guys want me to play with you? And we were like, yeah, yeah. And so he pulls his hoodie down because it was real cold. And we were talking about how we got to see the difference between, and a lot of us play, I played football in college. <laughs> 
not like that. <laughs> a lot of us played sports in college. One of my friends, was a great, great hockey player, great baseball player, great basketball player. He played baseball in college too. There was a difference. And we got to see that once we had this NFL prospect who was about to get, uh, start his life with the Green Bay Packers playing out there with regular folks. And I won't say it, but one of the guys on the field that day was like, is that such and such? And he was a star back then. And I was really like, maybe. <laughs> And so the reason why I mentioned that story is when we're talking about the life of Job, we're saying it's one thing for God to say, this guy's got real speed. It's another thing for you to see what he looks like running next to you and your friends. It's one thing for God to say something about Job that's real nice. He's a man of character. He's blameless and whatnot. But all these struggles are helping us, what, helping us see what it looks like when a man that God brags on is actually under pressure. And so that's what that athlete who was going on in the Green Bay Packers helped me understand. I don't necessarily know what it looked like for Job if I was sitting at his bedside, but I hope I wouldn't have added to his burdens the way that the friends did. But I hope I would have likewise appreciated the opportunity like that young man, Elihu, did, who we're going to see in the second half of this re uh, chapter's readings, or set of readings, what it must have been like for him to even, as he's trying to correct some of the things that Job has wrong, to still be able to see what it looks like for a righteous man to struggle in real time, right? Because it's one thing for me to uh, uh, go, like I said, I said it all the time, I can tell you what to do with your life from up here in the pulpit, right? <laughs> but we gotta go home, <laughs> we gotta go home. And so one of the things we're seeing in this chapter is the way that a righteous man invested in the environment around him. When he had good stuff, he wanted to make sure you can't make, make not everybody's gonna make good decisions with what they got. Can you make everybody rich by simply giving them money? No. Some people are gonna make really bad choices. But sometimes you'll see, even with people who make bad, sometimes, not always, sometimes even with people who make bad choices with their own resources, they respect the fact that you are trying to help them. And so sometimes just the fact that you are trying can help do the best that you can to improve the environment in which you live. Can't fix everybody, can't fix me. I have enough trouble trying to fix me. <laughs> so you got some struggles too that I might wanna be patient with. Right? And so if I look at it from that perspective that I'm trying to help you with the perspective that, oh, I wish I could fix all my problems too, then I'm a little bit more gentle in my attitude towards you as I try to actually improve your life. And I think that is Job's wisdom. And I don't think it's just coming from a perspective of him wanting to increase the property value. I think he actually cares about people. Why? Because let's go on to verse 14. I put on righteousness and it clothed me. My justice was like a robe and a turban. I was eyes to the blind and feet to the lame. I was a father to the needy. I searched out the cause of him I did not know. Wait a minute, he's going above and beyond the call of duty. It's one thing for people to come to you with problems and you to be uh, kind to people who come to you, but to find out, wait a minute, I heard word in the wind that someone needs help. That's that other level that sometimes we see on the news. Where, I don't know if, if you're like me. When, when I wake up on Sunday morning, I'm looking for news stories that go beyond what I'm tempted to typically shake my finger at. That's not a great way for me to uh, get ready to come talk to y'all on Sunday morning. So I need stories that are a little bit more happy because I just think in life, just in the folks I'm getting a chance to meet, my life isn't perfect here, but I get to meet some people who are nice and kind. And it'd be cool if the news reflected their stories too, right? And so I think that when Job is getting wind, oh, of like we see sometimes there are people out in the community, it's none of my business, but I heard you might be able to use this. I think we, we are able to appreciate that struggle in Maui a little bit more now that the fires are a little bit closer to home, right? And I think that the fact that we've had people who have shown an example of what it's like before times have gotten tough near where they live at, it's impressive, as I've said. Short lessons this week. It's easier to care about people who you see caring about people before hard times hit, right? And so it's easy for me uh, to have my heart go out to people who aren't necessarily my neighbors because I've gotten to see their heart towards other people. So it ain't hard for me to be like Job in this chapter. One of the reasons why I like to look out is because I just want to see people do well sometimes. Verse 17. I broke the fangs of the unrighteous and made him drop his prey from his teeth. I don't think that's Job's business either. Then I thought, I shall die in my rest. Can we forgive Job for being a little bit presumptuous, presumptuous 
you ever you ever make your five or ten year plan a little bit too? Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> a little too ambitiously, right? I've done it. And like I said, one of the short lessons, one of the things that I couldn't appreciate out of my grandfather, we were living. I sound so pessimistic, Grandpa. Why are you always saying, Lord, saying the same? All I had to do was live a few more years for that wisdom to sink in. Into my bones, I'll call it. You ain't got to tell me a thing. I've seen enough changes in a 24-hour period to realize if God ain't saying the same, it ain't going to happen, bud. Plan it out all you want. <laughs> and so even in a wise man here in Job, we're seeing him get additional wisdom from the experience that's helping him understand, even though in his heart, here's the thing, our heart sometimes can guide us in the right direction, but it doesn't see the path along which God is leading us to the abundance that he has for us. I told you before, um, uh, boxer name of Floyd Mayweather. He calls himself Money Mayweather. Sometimes we get, ah, that guy's too much about money. We shake our finger at him. But God did not create us to struggle. He created struggle as the vehicle through which we would responsibly handle heaven. I don't know if money's going to matter much in heaven because we got abundance. The question is, how are we going to deal with it? And so the struggle isn't the point. And that's what Job is helping us to understand. That's the thing I loved about Floyd Mayweather after I stopped shaking my finger about, at him for bragging about his money all the time. Floyd had it on his heart, the right thing. Yes, God wants us in comfort, but he wants us to understand how to sacrifice. Oh, like Job, to make sure that if he's not there, like we said, with your kids, are things good with your kids when, you know, everything, you know, bills are all paid, but the kids are always fighting at home? How nice is that? You like that? Yeah. You want to have to, how free are you in an environment where you can't leave the house? Big house, everything's paid for, but you can't live because you don't know if they're all going to be alive when you get back. <laughs> right? How much peace is there in that? There's no peace in that. So what's heaven like if God's always got to be right there? Okay, of course it's good we have the Holy Spirit, but the, the Bible literally says don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Is his presence always to be there as a mediator to pull us off each other? No. He wants to have some peace, too. And that means he wants to be able to give us all that stuff that comes freely in heaven without always having to be there to pull us apart. And so when you see Job with the spirit of when he's given me something, I'm going to use it to create peace. Oh, guess what? We said it seems like we're getting a great picture of Jesus and not just Jesus, but God in Job. And so if we're looking at a person, he's not all that different from Abraham. Abraham, was Abraham broke? No. Abraham left wealth for the promise of more wealth. And when there started to become infighting between he and his nephew, his nephew or cousin, whatever, Lot, their herdsmen, what did that conflict come about from? A picture of heaven. They had too much stuff. It wasn't scarce resources. God started answering that prayer right away, and they got to fighting over, over who's going to get the best stuff. What did Abraham do? Was the promise to Lot? We said it before. The promise was not to Lot. How did Abraham use his stuff? You get first choice, bud. Let's just get along. And then when Lot chose poorly, he chose the, he chose the oh man, this land looked like it's going to be easy to work, right? Productive. Location, location, location. Who are your neighbors, bud? Sodom and Gomorrah. I don't know if those are the neighbors you want. And so he picked the land that looked good, not doing enough of comps or comparison on who he was living next to. And so one of the reasons why it's really important to try to disagree good is because mama always used to say, you never know who you might need one. <coughs> and so as Lot chose the best real estate for himself or what looked like the best real estate for himself, and he quickly got himself kidnapped because people who don't like to work like nice stuff too. <laughs> and yours looks just as nice as theirs with less of a day of work, right? Lot quickly got himself kidnapped. And who had to come to the rescue? Well, he didn't have to, but he chose to. Abraham, <laughs> upwards of 70-some years of age, going back to war. I'm supposed to just be farming now. <laughs> Count my money, right? <laughs> but now I'm about to go back to war for what? Because a lot of poets cho chose poorly with my stuff. And so that's how Abraham used not just his stuff, but his life. It's like we've said before. It's easy to say once you tried to give a person a warning and they have ignored it, it still ended up in trouble anyway. That's on you, bud. That is on you. 
it's another thing to go beyond you on risking your stuff to create peace to now putting yourself in. There was no promise in the Bible that you're going to, God said you're going to have a, um, a child. Um, Miss Abraham or Sarah, she could have been impregnated before Abraham went off to war. Abraham didn't have to come back to make that promise fulfilled, right? <laughs> there was no promise that they didn't have a, a romantic evening before he goes off to war. The promise is fulfilled, and now Abraham, he was a great hero, but he ain't here no more. No, he risked it all, right, to create peace in an environment where he didn't have to. And so we're getting another picture of that here in Job. And so when we're seeing that, we're not just seeing pictures of people who take on heroic causes, but we're seeing people who, much like God, oh, wait a minute, we said it before, blessed are the, in the Beatitudes, peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And we talk about, I've talked about before, how do you bless the God who has everything? How do you bless the God who has everything? What am I going to give him? That's literally what they're going to talk about here. Elihu's going to pick it up again. If I'm righteous, it, all I'm doing is really benefiting myself. I can't reach up to heaven. God, there it is. No, he didn't care, right? The, he's literally going to say, the clouds are higher than me. The sky, the heavens are higher. So how are you going to reach God? No. He wants you to do right, but it really only benefits you. And if you do wrong, he might be upset at the fact that you're hurting other people. But are you literally, really, are your deeds reaching God? No. They're not reaching God. And so when you're doing these things, understand that the way that you can potentially bless a God that you really can't literally bless, just let him have some peace. Going back to that illustration with the kids, it's one thing to have everything, but create an environment with the things that he's given you that increase his ability to just rest. And that's what we seem to be seeing in men like Abraham and men like Job. They are people who get it. And we're seeing people like David, even in between them, a man after God's own heart. What did David do? When he put his army together, we talked about it before. Saul went around, he went around, what did he get? He got everybody who looked like they could scrap. That's my guy. <laughs> he didn't ask him. It was a draft. Don't look too talented in front of Saul because that's an inscription, right? What do they call it? Forced conscription or whatever? You got to go fight now. David went into a cave. And everybody that was bitter in spirit and broke and, and in a bad place, that's his new army. <laughs> and the reason why I'm mentioning this is because it's literally a picture of Jesus that we're going to see by the time we get to Isaiah. Let's keep reading so we can get to Isaiah. Um, he encouraged, even though he was a little bit presumptuous and uh, didn't realize uh, the road that God was going to take him on to get to that later prosperity was going to be very difficult. Verse 24, I smiled on them when they had no confidence. In the light of my face, they did not cast down. I chose their way I sat, sorry, and sat as a chief and lived like a king among, amongst his troops, like one who comforts mourners. Who else, do, who else did that? Isaiah, Isaiah, Isaiah. Who else did that? Isaiah 50. Isaiah 50. We talked about this before. Talked about this before. One of the interesting things about the Psalms, I think it's Psalm 46 that describes what seems like uh, Jesus when it's talking about the bride, uh, what is it, the, the wedding supper of, of the, the, the bridegroom. And it seems like it's talking about Christ because it talks about this whole um, series of characteristics that are going to connect to some descriptions we see of Christ in the Revelation. Um, and his, uh, his final um, regal, for lack of a better term, my vocabulary leave, leave me, majestic form, something like that. All right, when he's looking in his... Uh, heavenly form, the way that John, even people who walked with him, they don't recognize him anymore because that's how much more impressive he is now. That connects to one of the things it's going to say here about him too, a lesser known characteristic of the Christ in verse 4. The Lord has given me the tongue of those who are taught that I may know how to sustain with the word him who is weary. Morning by morning he awakens. He awakens my ear to hear as those who are taught. Understand how that's so similar to what Job is doing with his time. He says, with just a smile, I can encourage those who had no confidence. You know what it's like to be in a time? It's one thing for us to be in a, a place of confidence. Things are going well. Remember the last time you were publicly embarrassed? Didn't want to go back outside because, ah, everybody knows. <laughs> Certain parts of town you just wanted to stay away from because you knew everybody knew there. <laughs> who was Job to that person? Job was the person who could smile at them and restore them to a measure of self-confidence. And he said self-confidence is nothing compared to God confidence. But he can put them back in a position where they were no longer ashamed to show their face around town again, right? 
And so that's what Jesus is literally being described as being here. Verse 4, that how may I may know how to sustain with a word him who is weary. Keep going, please. Verse 6, I gave my back to those who strike and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting. Job didn't so much get to do it voluntarily, but understand what's going on here. Job is in a situation where he doesn't understand it, but all these things he seems to have found it a joy to do, helping those who are in need, smiling on those who were weak, pulling those who are in peril out of the teeth of those who would consume them. How much more is he doing that now? You think he had a jet plane back then? Could he get all over the known world? Or was he just blessing people where he could reach? See, what's happening is Job doesn't understand that in submitting himself to the suffering, he's done what we call it again in business. It's one thing, you see those old pictures of the McDonald's restaurants, right? <laughs> They're back on the lot, back when it seemed like, you know, they were feeding a few folks in a couple towns. Where's McDonald's now? They starting Pullman? Well, there they go, <laughs> right? They got two of them because they scaled. <laughs> they learned how to take a small business and create it uh, Basically, some you see over, they trying to get, if you go overseas, places where they don't have McDonald's, we look at McDonald's like, I don't want to eat that today. They're like, McDonald's is coming. McDonald's is coming. They care because American restaurants, even the ones we don't want to go to anymore, they have that kind of influence overseas where people, they're not, not, not everywhere. Because McDonald's learned how to scale it. And that's what's going on with Joe. See, the, the McDonald's guys, I guess they enjoyed the success of making burgers but they never knew what it was gonna look like on a larger scale. And so now they're able to feed people, even if, if it ain't the healthiest food on earth, scale whatever your favorite product is, it's also healthy and whatever, right? But now they're able to do it on a completely different scale. That's what Job is reaching right now. See, Job didn't have a train, a plane, or an automobile, so he'd go bless people all over the world. But I guarantee you, okay, I'm not guarantee you, I'm going too far. I'm pretty sure Job is saving lives to this day. Job been dead for a minute. If you really get to know what he's talking about or what he's going through in the pages of this story, he can sustain you too <laughs> in those moments, not only when you're ashamed to maybe go back outside or you don't know how uh, whatever is going to connect from day to day. Because if you're anything like me, it's right now, this period of my life is a day to day. I don't know what it's going to look like next, the next morning I won't wake up. Well, waking up seems all right, but <laughs> it's a new adventure. And so what Job is going through is a period of his life where he doesn't understand what the next day or the next moment is going to hold. And the more I actually started getting into these stories this time around, the more I started realizing that God was scaling Job's love for helping people through Job's pain and his suffering. See, here we scale a business through taking it to the bank. If you really look at the story of the founder, those guys scaled McDonald's, some of it against their will. <laughs> wasn't always the most honest of business dealings that led it to being what it is today. But that's the pain that sometimes comes through scaling. And that's what's happened, sorry, happening here with Job. And so in your moment of discouragement, the thing that I would hope you would take away from this is like we've started to, to talk about. And I like the fact that it seems like it's becoming a theme in class. That's something I got to mention. That's like we had, my, we had my imaginary stick on Wednesday. Chelsea beat the dead horse. That's all right. I don't want to be the only one. Sometimes those dead horse issues are what we call themes. <laughs> and those themes are the things that you need to carry you through. Because once we are gone out of each other's presence, that uh, a bit of encouragement we can sometimes get from one another, it fades after a while, doesn't it? Right? And so the things that stick with you are what we call retention. What are we retaining? from these moments together. And so that's what sometimes those dead horse issues, they become <laughs> material in the mind and the heart to keep me going when I just, like we said, Job said it today, we said he was early on, I'm better off dead. And so he is the kind of people, he, sorry, Job is, a, uh, is, is, is scaling the kind of experience that to this day, if you let him, he is allowing you to survive moments when you feel that you are better. Dead. One of my favorite comedians talked about it before he got married. Message, anyway. <laughs> he talked about uh, people, and he, I used to love it because he would joke about um, his tendency. And the cool thing is there were before and after picture, pictures. One of the reasons why it's so important to let Job encourage you is because this, pro, this um, um, comedian, before he got married, he was a single, old, single guy. Like, yeah. But bottom line is, I don't want to say that too much, but the bottom line is 
he was openly talk about how for me, there were certain things that would happen in my life that if the day got too tough, it's like, I'm better off dead. And he made that part of his routine. He hadn't told a suicide joke since he got married. Now, here's the thing. There are plenty of things I've heard of in marriage that can make you want to just throw up your hands. But understand, in life, even if you're finding your difficulty within marriage, there are things in life where it can be like, like we said, Job did not realize that the thing on his heart, that perfection that he thought his life was going to look like forever, God put that there because that's where God was bringing him. But the path to getting there came through wanting to just have it all end. And so the beauty of Job's story here is basically what he is doing is he is um, allowing us to see, and like we said, Job never gets his answer. He literally never gets an answer to the question of why. When God shows up, he simply does two things. He simply says, you, you're right. You're right, right about one thing, Job. You don't understand why I'm doing this. But the second thing you don't understand is you weren't going through this because you did wrong. You were right. Um, and I'm going to add this as a Marcus ad lib. Sounds cheesy. But I had somebody who was helping me out just yesterday. Another guy. He sent me a heart emoji on one of my messages. I was like, guys can't do that to each other. I was like, I love that heart was, I was like, brother, I'm so glad you feel comfortable enough with me to send me that heart emoji because I need to know the fact that you, you suggested you love what I said right now. I love you, brother, because of what you did for my family, right? And that's what God did when he came to help Job. He didn't answer all his questions. He just reminded Job that he still loved him. And notice that Job didn't ask him any more questions after that. We got chapter upon chapter what Job, Job was going to ask God if he got to see him, right? <laughs> That's what most of the book is about. And then I would say this, and then I would say this, and then God shows up. I love you, Job. Okay. <laughs> That's pretty much a short synopsis of those three chapters. Because there are some times when all of my, um, my frustration and all of my doubt and all the things that make me want to check out just have to do with the fact that I don't really feel loved right now. And so understand how Job is helping us to understand that just because you don't feel loved right now does not mean that that phone call is not around, just around the corner. That heart emoji from somebody you never expected it from, that sustained me. <laughs> it's an emoji, who cares? It comes from a place you wouldn't ordinarily expect. It. You don't know where, where that's coming from. And if you quit, you don't get it. That's the thing. As difficult as it got, Job had more on his heart because Job was going to be richer than when he started. As long as he could let God use him to help other people get through to their moments where they were going to be richer than they ever imagined. <laughs> and so likewise, when we see a picture of Jesus here, um, look at, look at, let's just skip to the end. I promise. I'm going to try to do just the 30 minutes. 28 right now. We'll see. We'll end it. Skip to the end. Understand, we had magnificent points from chapter 52 and then chapter 53 of what Jesus is like, but let's just skip to chapter 56 so Marcus can. No, okay, okay, okay. Help me. 53, 53. A couple of important points from chapter 53. In, a, in addition to Jesus literally submitting himself. Did y'all hear that? Had y'all heard that before? First time I heard that ver verse. He submitted himself to those who pulled out the beard. Snatched his hair out of his face. <laughs> All so that he could provide encouragement to those he didn't have to encourage, right? And so in addition to that, chapter 52, we talked about it before in, in class. Uh, verse 14 of chapter 52, as many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. Under, understand, that that's a similar reference to what we saw in Esther when it talked about how pretty she was in both uh, appearance and in form. It's talking about body and face. Uh, understand how thoroughly Christ was beaten. It wasn't just his face that was marred and disfigured. It's his form and his appearance that was beaten just that badly. And so when we're seeing in Job someone who was involuntarily drafted into the suffering that was going to be scaled to help many, understand how much more courage it took for the Christ to volunteer for this level of suffering in order to help lift the face of those of us who were uh, ashamed or discouraged or simply wanted to quit. 
How do we know the scope of that? Well, much like Job, back up a little bit for me, please. In verse 5, when uh, God is talking about his own name, where he says, Now, therefore, after he has been ashamed by the behavior of his people Israel, now, therefore, what have I here, declares the Lord, seeing that my people are taken away for nothing. Their rulers wail, declares the Lord. And continually, all day long, my name is despised. Why is that important? Well, that's what Job is going through right now. Most of chapter um, 30 that follows chapter 29, where we start, it talks about how even in, well, in contrast to what Job was like in his prime, oh, once I lost it all, there went the friends. And not only did the friends go, people who were scared to maybe even look up at me, now they're looking down on me and they are finding joy in my misery. Not only are they finding joy in my, in my misery, like we talked about on, on Wednesday night, they are doing the, the dangerous thing about finding joy in other people's misery is not just the fact that I might passively take, um, take, take, take joy in the fact that you're suffering. I might also go further to take some steps to keep you there. And that's what the next chapter talks about. The fact that they go further to make sure that they are in a position where their self-esteem at the bottom rung, outcast rung of the ladder, uh, still at least has somebody to look down on. They're going to do some things, it seems, to make sure Job stays in a position where they can have self-esteem without their own personal progress. But understand how it's not just there. We're going to see that in Jesus as well. Because like we said, in chapter 53, it's going to say that, like we have noticed before, verse 3, when it's talking about the suffering servant, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, as one from whom men hide their faces. That's Job. Oh, wait, no, that's the Christ. And so understand when he says in his steps, when we are to walk in his image, some of these things, when he's encouraging us in the Sermon on the Mount, he starts them out with the Beatitudes. Why does he tell us to recognize when we're being blessed? Because when we're really being blessed, it's not going to feel like it. It's not going to feel like it. And so that's why he's going through all these things. Blessed are those who mourn, for they'll be comforted. Blessed are the meek. No, they're not. Why not the mighty for the meek? Because <laughs> you understand how to understand how to, uh, if you got power, to control it and direct it in a healthy way. That's what meekness is, right? We say power under control. It's not weakness. Blessed are those, as we've already talked about, uh, the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst. Oh, we all hunger and thirst for food, but for righteousness, right? Those are the things. And then ultimately, those things don't sound like they're so much the, the stuff of suffering. But he says, blessed are you when you are persecuted. <laughs> Literally, when you're going through it for the sake of God. Why? Because it points back to what we're talking about right here. We are in a, like the Faith Hall of Fame in Hebrews 11. Even though you might be going through it by yourself, you are not alone because you are in a long line. Uh, I saw a podcast this week. We are suffering together alone. Or I think they said suffering alone together. They're talking about a phenomenon in the culture right now where a whole lot of people are feeling super isolated, but you're not the only one. Why? Because the whole podcast is about how a whole bunch of people are feeling super isolated. And that's what we're looking at in this train of heroes, going back to um, in Hebrews 11 and before. Abraham, he didn't have a whole lot of people to consult when he was like, okay, well, what are we going to do with this lot thing? He had soldiers, he had people working for him. But the person who was closest to him, eh, he's not so good with right now, right? Likewise, David, when he's living out in the cave, <laughs> he just had to be blessed. He happened to be blessed with people who came out to him. But his isolation is what the rallying cry was. It wasn't his mic then, right? That's not Job we're seeing. He's surrounded, like we said, in a room full of people. You can still be alone. And that's what he's dealing with right now. And so likewise with the Christ. Ain't nobody else can, can deal that, that pulling at the beard for you, even if they're going with it too. The ones closest to you by now, we all know the story since we were yay high, they ran. And so he's going through it alone. And so in our times of isolation, part of what makes them seem heavier is making it seem, or is to, to, to the degree it feels abnormal. But it's not abnormal. And that's what that podcast was pointing to, and that's what Job is helping us realize as he points to the Christ. Christ is helping you to understand that the more you actually relate to him, the better you are able to hold up in those times of isolation. The more you realize that in order to get through those times of isolation, you are by yourself, but you are not alone, Elijah in the cave. Why did that matter? Because Elijah wasn't able to see what God was about to tell him. I've got 7,000 others who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Alone has been a part of it ever since before the time of Christ in the New Testament alone was always something that we'd have to negotiate. And here's the catch. Alone is the thing that helps us identify with him better, and that's the job description. I hate saying that. <laughs> that's what we signed up for. But that really is. when we The whole baptism thing, <laughs> that's what we signed up for. 
and I hate saying it because I hate going through it. And I hate going through it enough to not even, even if I'm mad at you. I'm, I, I looked away from Shelly. I'm not mad at Shelly. I'm, <laughs> Everybody knows. Oh, yeah. Shelly's, Marcus, Marcus' favorite. I'm always picking on Shelly for good reason. So anyway, so anyway, with that, the bottom line is, um, look, he's, he's not leaving us in, in lonely places because um, we're the, the only ones here. I completely lost my train of thought with that tangent. I'm usually able to wrap it, wrap it back in, but no. Here's the bottom line. Bottom line is um, loan is what we signed up for. And to the degree we are able to understand that that's a part of us becoming more like Christ, then we're more able to, like we said, most of these stories, um, like Job's suffering, this is a, um, uh, from one generation to the next, us recovering the stories of people who have been able to overcome through understanding that even when you feel like um, not only are you alone, but you have no right to go back into certain circles. This is why we wanted to turn forward to, um, let's, let's turn forward to chapter 53, verse 10. Where he's going to say, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. Once again, he's not talking about Job anymore. And he has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Understand, when Jesus was on the cross, he said this interesting thing. My Lord, my Lord, why have you forsaken me? Oh, that is so similar to what Job is talking about in these multiple appeals on what might feel like his deathbed. Because he starts talking a while because I will go the way of those who go to Shoal, right? I'm not coming back from this. It doesn't feel like I'm coming back from this. Understand, once again, you're getting another picture of what the Christ went through when he felt, at least it seems like through his words, forsaken. And literally, unlike Job, who made the mistake of thinking God was doing this to him, who was doing it to Christ? It literally seems like God was actually doing it to Christ. And so beyond those times when you're alone, but you feel like God is actually the one who is doing these things to you. I appreciate the fact that our brother this morning made the distinction between um, God tempting people and testing them. Because that's one translation early on in the Old Covenant that says God tempted such and such. But the translation, the more modern translation, say he tested. Why? Because that verse he, uh, he quoted later on. Um, God doesn't tempt anybody. That's Satan's racket. And so ultimately, there are times when it can seem like in the earlier chapters of Job, when the fire is coming, they call it fire from heaven. It seems like it's coming from God. But even if it is coming from God, understand that's the thing that makes you more like Christ, not necessarily in perfection and character, but in being perfected, because that's the beauty of the story is that even though I seem hopeless, like we talked about um, in the communion talk, being able to focus our minds on the right things. Man, if I could just, if I could always be in co complete control of whatever it was I wanted to do and think and this and this and that, oh man, my y'all couldn't tell me nothing. That's what the kids say now, <laughs> right? But the struggles in my mind, the thing that I need to use to God willing hear from God, when it's really just prayer. <laughs> but the thing that I think I'm filtering the messages through, when I can't control that, God is showing me just how little of that is going into what He gives me to say. <laughs> If I just shut up and say what it seems like he's making clear to me, I think I'm doing a better job than when I'm figuring it out and writing the outline, right? And so what he is doing is helping me understand how even when I feel like he is the one attacking me in mind or in spirit, um, that ultimately, let, let's look at where it ends up. He said, the will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand, the end of verse 10. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, oh, wait a minute, make many to be accounted righteous. It's that whole concept of scaling again. And so once again, through Christ's pain, he is scaling the ability. Like Christ said, it's better for me that I go away. Why? Because if I go away, who's coming? The Holy Spirit, the one who is going to be with each and every one of you in ways that I was not when I was in the flesh. And so in much the same way that God, through Job's suffering, scaled stories that help us get through times of isolation, through Christ's suffering, when he was literally being beaten by his own father, 
he was scaling a level of companionship that we never would have known if he simply did it the easy way. And so likewise with us, when we are going through those times when God seems like he is either clearly letting this happen on his watch or he might seem like he is the one who is actually doing it, understand we are in a long line of people through whom he is scaling assistance to others through those times when we feel afflicted. Not just afflicted, not just isolated, but like God has turned against us. Understand, it's never the suffering that's the point. It's the ability to create an environment where and nobody got to check the comps. We don't got to call up to find out what the neighborhood is like. He's allowing me to suffer so that I can get any piece of real estate I want on any piece of heaven and make sure, like we said before, ain't no doors locked, <laughs> ain't no windows closed. You can keep the house however you want. Ain't nobody breaking in. See, my thing is I want it to be an easy button kind of situation. Just like he spoke the earth into existence like we talked before, I want him to just speak that into existence. But what he has done is for whatever reason, going back to the whole concept of a war in heaven, it seems like they tried that before. Revelation 12, the devil was the most, what is it, uh, probably the most beautiful of all creation, uh, preeminent in wisdom. How did it work out the first time? See, he tried it that way, just giving it to everybody easy. But he's also given us a life to understand. What's it like? Like we said, you can't always fix everybody with just dropping some money on them. How's that work out in your benevolence work? No. There are some difficulties that people have to go through to learn how to be responsible with greater and greater blessings. Jesus literally says it throughout most of his ministry. The one who can't be trusted with the little can't be trusted with much. And so my time here on this earth is helping me to understand or helping God to show to all of us. Um, what's it really worth? And are you really able to handle all that he's going to give us? And so when we're looking at Job and we're looking at the Davids and the Abrahams and they're all pointing forward to the Christ, understand how broad a scope they're trying to send or extend the salvation out to. Chapter 56, where I promised to end up. Verse 3, let not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say, the Lord will surely <laughs> separate me from his people. Why? Because I feel like I'm not good enough. That's my ad lib. Going on in the verse, though. And let not the eunuch say, behold, I am a dry tree. That's the eunuch. Sometimes we'll say that the eunuch is one who was simply symbolically, um, uh, for lack of a better term, castrated so they could be trusted around the king's harem, right? But this is a chapter that's going to be like, no, it seems like they were literally um, physically castrated. Well, why do you think that, Marcus? Verse 5, I will give in my house, sorry, I will give it in my house and within my walls a monument and a name better than sons and daughters. Oh, wait a minute. If he can't reproduce, why is he bringing that up? Uh, or if he still can reproduce, why is he bringing that up? I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be, oh, cut off. It seems to be a metaphor for what eunuchs were actually going through. Understand, that was also a violation of the law. As a eunuch, if you had um, basically cut yourself off in that way, you couldn't go close to the assembly of God. You couldn't move close to the, to, the, the, to the assembly, to the temple or the tabernacle. You were an outcast. And what he is saying is all this suffering that his son is going through is to bring back home those who have changed their lives in permanent ways where you can never be the same again. You've made mistakes that you can't undo. See, it's one thing if I feel like I can undo it or I can see a way out. But once again, we said this is the difference between optimism, I see a way out, and hope. I still keep going even though it seems hopeless. That's the scope of the salvation that God is working out through suffering. So understand, when he's asking us to go through suffering in order to scale the salvation he's bringing, he's saying, why? Is it just in vain just because he likes to put us through our paces? No, because there are people out there who are hurting just that much. And it's one thing for us to say, I've done all this for you, but it's another thing to be able to say, I know what it's like to be on the outskirts of that society or the fringe of that meeting, um, to know what it's like not only to not want to bring your head back in, because everybody knows that you got, they got, they got this thing up, what was it, the scarlet letter? Sometimes the scarlet letter was on your clothes. He's saying even when the scarlet letter's on your body, you are still welcome. But it's not on our own terms. Why? Keep reading, please. Keep pre reading, please. Verse 6. And the foreigner who joins, them, joins themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord, and to be his servants. Everyone who keeps the Sabbath and does not profane it and holds fast my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in 
my house of prayer. There are times when, like you said, it's one thing to just be welcomed back in, but it's another thing to have your joy made complete. Meaning, I remember the first time, my, my feet are busted, y'all, and I don't like talking about it. But when I went to go do a certain athletic endeavor, I took jujitsu for a while. And then involves taking your shoes off or your, your, your socks off in front of people. And they got to look at your feet. My feet are busted. <laughs> but the leader at that gym, in addition to being a skilled man in jujitsu, he's like, Marcus, take your shoes off. Nobody cares about what your feet look like here. I was like, all right, fine, that's what you're saying, but they're all going to. Oh, wait a minute. They're treating me like my feet aren't atrocious, which they are, either. <laughs> And they're literally acting like they're not disgusted by what my toenails look like, because I'm disgusted by what? Sharing too much. But hey, <laughs> if I ain't confessing, well, why should I ask you to? But I go into a jujitsu gym, learning, wanting to learn to do some moves, and I learned a lesson on genuine acceptance. See, it's one thing to be accepted in a place where they're like, look at that guy. <laughs> it's another thing for them to make you feel like your irreparable physical damage ain't really what they care about. As long as you're here to help promote the peace. It's like I always say my dead horse is, it ain't unconditional, but it is mighty surprising the degree to which he is trying to welcome us back home. So if we can take that degree of forgiveness and spread that out to others to the point where we ain't got to check, like we said, comparative sales, and he's trying to create us into or recreate us into the kind of people who fit into a heaven. Like we said, we ain't nobody locking doors. <laughs> Nobody's checking stories. You got to worry about what's going on in or out of your presence because it's all good. But that all goes through. Joke. <laughs> Sorry. In our days or our willingness to be perfected like Christ was through suffering. Which is why we often say God's best to you as you go forward in him enduring the difficult days that are going to lead to you becoming very, very rich.